Let's take our Bibles and let's turn together to Luke chapter 22. This is the next miracle that we find in the Gospels that Christ performed. Perhaps not a miracle that you think much of, but nonetheless a miracle. And that was when they came to arrest our Lord Jesus in the garden that Peter took out a sword and cut off Malchus the high priest's servant's ear. This is the same Peter that had told our Lord that if he went to prison or death that he would be right there. And the Lord said to Peter, he didn't even know what he was talking about because before the cock would crow in the morning, early morning, that he would deny him three times but here now we see him in the garden and uh, again Peter zealous to defend our Lord not realizing that the Lord was to go to this cross that his father had given him had been predetermined and uh, therefore necessary that he should go alone but nonetheless just like any of us we feel like we need to add our works contribute what we do and I'll tell you when you do that with regard to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ all you can do is mess it up but it doesn't change his work that even with this the Lord used it as an occasion not only to glorify himself as Lord, but also to teach submission to his disciples. So that's what we're going to look at here, how Jesus heals a servant's ear. I actually saw a nice, cute title. I'm not about cute, but I saw someone that called this a kiss and a cut. Because there's a kiss here and there's a cut. We'll see how that is. But in Luke 22, in verses 47 to 53, let's read this, and then I'll make some comments about it. It says, And while he yet spake, he had gone into the garden to pray. And it says that while he yet spake, Behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas one of the twelve went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. So there's the kiss. And Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? It's not that he was surprised by it. The question was asked for Judas' sake, to expose him. And when they which were about him saw what would follow, in other words, they, were, they came to take our Lord as had been determined already. But they that saw him and what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with a sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. So there's the cut, the kiss and the cut. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. In other words, don't be trying to intervene. This was the work which the Lord Jesus had, had come to accomplish. To bear the contradiction of sinners against himself. And uh, that none would intervene or in any way lighten what it was he was to accomplish. This was to be a work between him and the Father alone. And here's where we see the miracle then. And he touched his ear and healed him. I'm not sure exactly how this would have taken place because it says up there in verse 50 that the, the right ear was completely cut off. And so he would have picked it up and uh, touching it healed him then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders 
which were come to him, Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves? When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me, but what? This is your hour and the power of darkness. So even in this, the Lord was directing every detail of what was taking place. And when it came time for him to be arrested in the garden, we can see how upset the disciples were, and you can understand it. Put yourself there. You've walked with this man for three years, and now they've come to gather him, and maybe they're thinking like in other times he'd always walked out, but not this time. And it wasn't because suddenly they were more powerful than he, but as he said here, this was their hour. This was the hour of darkness, the power of darkness. I can't even imagine how dark this hour would be because this would be the hour which God had purposed from before the foundation of the world and all time came down to this hour. I know people are arguing today, well, God's not subject to time and we can't make a big deal about when he died or what he accomplished or when he died. Well, the scriptures do. This is a time word. This is your hour when God had purposed that he should be delivered into their hands over there in Acts chapter 2 and uh, verse 23 it's very specific that what is taking place here was a, a, according to God's determinate will it says verse 23 him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. When it says foreknowledge of God, that word foreknowledge, it's not just that God knew ahead of time what they were going to do. God knows ahead of time because he's already determined ahead of time. And therefore, everything they did by taking him with wicked hands and crucifying and slaying him, who were they? Who were these that came to get him? They were the priests. What was God doing? Delivering up his lamb into their hands. They had delivered up lambs for sacrifices for years, but now the lamb of God was put in their hands to be delivered up according to his determinate counsel. And it says over there in Acts chapter 4 and verse 27 and 28, for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod, remember Herod was the Jewish ruler that Rome had placed there to keep the Jews in line. They hated him because he was a Jew that served the Roman government. And Pontius Pilate, he was a Roman. So these were leaders with the Gentiles and what? The people of Israel. That was the then known world. You were either a Gentile or you were Jew. What does it say here? They were gathered together, verse 28, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. That's important. It was determined before, but it had to be done. All this nonsense of people talking about the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That's not what the scriptures say. If you go over there to Revelation chapter 13, let me show that to you. Revelation 13, so you can get this right. You've probably heard it quoted wrong, and you've probably heard preachers say, you don't need to turn there because I can just quote it for you. Well, they're quoting it wrong. Revelation 13, 8 and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Who's that talking about? That's talking about the Antichrist. And remember, Antichrist is not some man yet to come. John wrote that, as you've heard, that Antichrist shall come. There are many Antichrists that have gone out in the world. 
It's not the spirit of Christ, it's the spirit of Antichrist. But many will worship him, worship his religion. That's free will religion. Anything that is not Christ alone is, is Antichrist. But who will worship him? It says, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb. That's who, whose book it is, whose scroll it is. And how is he described? Slain, it says, from the foundation of the world. Now you go and get your concordance and look up that word from. It means since. But everybody quotes it before. The lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Christ didn't have a body before the foundation of the world. There was no blood to be shed before the foundation of the world. There was no sin before the foundation of the world. By one man, what? Sin entered into the world and death by sin. So people violate the scriptures when they act as if all of this, because God decreed it before the foundation of the world, then it was done before it was done. That's why this is important here when it speaks there in Acts 4 and verse 28 that they did unto him what had been determined beforehand to be done. That's why when we read here in Luke 22, even though the disciples were all upset, and you can imagine, they're ready with their swords. They were bearing their swords. That's what they did back in the day. There were many zealots that were ready at any moment to drive the sword into, the, into one of the, the Roman legions. But all of that, our Lord was not unsettled. Why? Because it was for this hour that he came into this world. And uh, so... That's the context, what we're seeing here, first of all. I, I wrote here just a simple outline, the context, and then what were the circumstances, and then what was the conclusion. Three C's, <laughs> easy to remember. So the context here is that this is the hour that God the Father had determined for his son. When the Lord told his disciples back there in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you, and when I go... I'll come again and receive you unto myself. He wasn't talking about going into heaven, prepare a place. He was talking about going to the cross. And that troubled the disciples even then. And that's why the Lord said not to be troubled, but to believe on him. But here we see the unfolding then in this context of what God had determined. There was a multitude a number of those that were sent to arrest the Lord Jesus, they tried before and failed. They could not, but now was his hour. And they did it with lots of people. An entire army gathered here. Roman soldiers also formed a part of this crowd, according to John 18. If you look over there, John chapter 18 this is where it's good to have scriptures, comparing scripture with scripture. But in John 18, in verse 3, it says here, Judas, then having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, it's interesting, they typically didn't get along with the Romans. Neither did Herod with Pilate. But when it comes to going against our Lord Jesus Christ, now they're unified. I liken it to congregations today and preachers. I've had to deal with them all the years that the Lord has been pleased to teach me the gospel. That these congregations typically don't get along. you got your Baptists over here. You've got your Pentecostals here. you got your Catholic here. and They're all separated in their corners and they... They can't cooperate on anything, won't. But put a gospel preacher in their midst and have him stand and declare salvation in, by, and through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ alone without any works of man contributing and that 
salvations of the Lord alone, and all of a sudden you find all of these coming together to kick you out. I've been in those situations. They'll run you out of town. Well, that's what we see here. But over in verse 12, not only the Jews and the, the chief priests and Pharisees, but over there in verse 12, it says, then the band of the captain of the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Well, the captain of the officers, that's, that's the Romans that formed a part of this crowd. So this included captains of the temple, all the prominent people of the day, and they drew near, but it wasn't that they needed Judas in any way to identify him because he was known. They knew who he was. When it says that, coming back to our scripture text here in Luke 22, that as he approached, that Judas betrayed him with a kiss. It says, and while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of them, one of the twelve, went before them. You can imagine this picture, how pompous Judas must have felt at this moment. Such was his hatred for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing when you think that the Lord had chosen him as a son of perdition and been sent out to preach the gospel of the kingdom. He preached the words. All the while in his own heart, he was an enemy. And yet now, as he drew near unto Jesus to kiss him, our Lord knew the irony of being betrayed with a warm greeting. So he essentially asked Judas here, are you so dead? That'd be basically a way to put it. To all feeling that you can kiss and betray me? He put the question right to him there in verse 48. It wasn't that he was surprised, but this was directed at Judas. This would be a good example of what the scriptures talk about, a seared conscience. And there are many with seared consciences today that deny the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, have no feeling at all about following after another gospel, one that denies Christ the glory in his life and his death. And they can talk about this in, in just ways that their hearts aren't even pricked. The betrayal of our Lord Jesus Christ was a terrible sin. And Judas, this is where we see an example again of God's sovereignty and man's will. Because Judas was not being forced. It's not like Judas was holding back thinking, I don't really want to do this. No, he had already connived, even though later he regretted, but re regret is not repentance. Yet, here he was doing what he wanted to do, all the while accomplishing the will of God the Father and that of the Son. Even in this, our Lord Jesus Christ was orchestrating every detail as to his arrest. And... Uh, so God in his providence used this as a way to deliver up his son into the hands of wicked men. But again, let's stop and think. If he came to pay our sin debt, as we say he did, then they were my representative. They were our representative. They were doing what we would have done and have done. My sins nailed him to the cross. And it was for my sin that he died. And so, if they captured our Lord in a fight, you can imagine they're thinking as they come to approach him, is he going to fight? And you can see even the ignorance of his disciples seeing those that would follow him. 
It's interesting that they took the time to ask the Lord the question, Lord, shall we smite with a sword? But they didn't even wait for a response. That's like people that have made up their mind already when they cry unto the Lord in their prayer. They've already determined what they want. Well, be careful what you ask. Because they asked the question, and then immediately it says one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. We know that in John's rendition of this, if you go over to John chapter 18 and verse 10, John identifies who it is. For whatever reason, Luke didn't. Luke was the doctor, so it's interesting that he describes the right ear. It would be like a, a doctor diagnosing what part actually got cut off here. He was precise in that, but... Over here in John chapter 18 and verse 10, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So he was a servant of the high priest. But the Lord had already, you can see in John 18, all this is, although this is not recorded here, in Luke 22, but you remember when they came to seek him, and the Lord said, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, in verse 5, John 18, Thus saith unto them, then Jesus saith unto them, It says, I am he, he is an italic, I am. He was declaring himself to be the very one that they denied, as God in the flesh. And Judas also which betrayed him stood with them. So that was the context here of the healing of the servant's ear. The circumstance of the healing, if you talk about healing, then there had to be something that happened, and that's what happened. Peter, the swordsman, some say, well, he must have been swinging for his head because he certainly was trying to kill him and just got the ear. We don't know. We know the Lord directed even the swing of the sword. There's not a dust speck that rises up off the hoof of a, a horse, but what God causes it to rise, float, and land where he's purposed. I know some people mock that and say, oh, no, you, you know, you're getting too detailed there. No, this whole world is the Lord's. We live and move and have our being in him. And here clearly, he, though he did it in his passion, our Lord purposed that it be done, that here would be one more occasion to prove his glory as God. And when Peter used the sword power, a lot of times we think that that's how we do God's work, sword power. You can read back in history, the Crusaders, they thought that they could establish an earthly kingdom when they went, went out and tried to conquer. And with a sword, sought to convert people to the kingdom of Christ. That's what the Crusaders are all about. But that's not how God purposed that his kingdom should be established. What is the sword power that the Spirit uses? It's the word. And if you look in John chapter 18, it's interesting when these fell back, they fell backward when he said, I am. But he also said in the context, verse 8, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am, he's an italic, if therefore you seek me, let these go their way. Our Lord's standing there already declaring substitution. You take me, these go. That's what substitution is. And he says that the saying might be fulfilled, because he said that already in his prayer in John 17, of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Now he said that in the hearing of Peter and these others. But they were so distraught that their passion got the best of them. And I'm sure it seems that the others had their swords drawn as well. But Peter was the first to go at it as if he had not even heard what the Lord had said. 
He doesn't need our help. He doesn't need us to somehow by our power or will to make sure his work is accomplished. No. He came to do that work on behalf of his people. So let's learn from this. Sometimes we think we can force things and get them done for Christ's glory. But Christ's work is to do what he came to do. And that's why back here in Luke chapter 22, in my text, in verse... Fifty-one, Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. When he said, Suffer ye thus far, what he's saying is, Let this be what it is. Why? Because this is his will. And uh, so he told his disciples who had resorted to violence, Let it be as far as this. In a colloquial way of saying it, we might say, hear him say, stop it, no more of this. <laughs> he doesn't need our help. How many times do we need to hear the Lord maybe speak that word to us? Because certain circumstances we think, well, he's not getting the glory here. And so we, we try to find ways of intervening. But here he said, stop it, no more of this. That's the circumstance. So the, the conclusion, that's what we come to here, the actual miracle. It says that he touched his ear and healed him. You can imagine this servant all of a sudden is without an ear. But it says he touched him. That, that's a word of tenderness. He didn't rebuke the disciple for doing it, even though he had done it. Here we see again, as in most cases, doesn't the Lord clean up our messes? <laughs> he takes our messes and our wanderings and our willfulness and uses it all for his glory. And uh, therefore, what was he doing? Not only healing the servant's ear, but he was healing the damage done by Peter. Aren't you glad that's the case? There's nothing you or I can do ever. We can look back and say, boy, I sure messed that up. Or I should have, would have, should have, could have. Nope. It all worked out exactly as God purposed. And the Lord used it even here, not only to demonstrate his power right up to the last, picking up that ear, healing it. That's an amazing thing right there. Surgeons, it takes hours to put fingers back on and ears. I saw recently where a kid had lost his head, except for some of the arteries, main arteries, and they put him in surgery for hours and put his head back on. And there was a kid standing there talking. That's an amazing thing, but then the doctors admitted, had those arteries been cut, they couldn't have done anything about it. So here was a member that was completely cut off, and the Lord, as creator, as sovereign, took that ear and put it right back. To demonstrate again who he was. They'd already seen these fall backward when he said, I am. All this did was contribute all the more to his glory. But the real reason for all of this, as these stood here and watched and observed, they didn't have to tackle him. They didn't have to, to, to arrest him as, as they did. They did bind him. Because in other times he had walked through them. But here the Lord determined that this was their hour. That's what he said. When I was daily with you in verse 53 in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me. They couldn't arrest him until it was his time. And so here our Lord explains why he went with the chief priests with the captains of the temple and the elders without a fight. And the many soldiers that came to arrest him, there was a whole legion of soldiers that were there, a band of 
a band, when it says they're a band of soldiers, they, they reckon that's about 600. It was a big crowd coming to arrest one man. But he didn't put up a fight because, as he said, now was his time for him to lay down his life and for them to arrest him and to kill him. I don't read that lightly to think that this is what God purposed that should be the way of redemption of that people that the Father had given him. And so if we wonder how it was that it all came down to this, there's the explanation. This is your hour and the power of darkness. How great is that darkness when you consider my sin? See, we don't even see it as God sees it, but how great is that darkness for the Lord Jesus Christ to take that sin upon him and to bear it away so that sinners such as we are might be justified. That's where our salvation was accomplished. That's where our redemption was accomplished. That's where our justification was accomplished. That's where our sanctification was accomplished in this work of the Lord Jesus Christ to his honor and glory alone. We don't know anything about Malchus, the servant, whether he ever was granted repentance or not. But the Lord still used this as a demonstration of his power over all flesh to give eternal life unto as many as he has purposed, the Father has given him.